call them change makers. Call them rule breakers. We call them redefiners. Hi, everyone, and welcome back to Redefiners. I'm Huda Tahoon, a leadership advisor at Russell Reynolds Associates, and I'm here with my amazing co-host, Clark Murphy. Hey, Hoda. Welcome back. Great to see you. Absolutely. We're going to have a phenomenal episode. We have a great guest who combines sharp intellect and a good sense of humor. So we're going to jump right in. We're pretty excited about it, I have to tell you. I'm so excited, Clark. And you know, the economy seems to be something that's on everyone's mind these days, especially with all of the national elections happening around the world. Some countries obviously continue to battle through some financial challenges, while others seem to be on smoother, smoother paths. So uh, we're going to unpack a lot today. Yeah, I think as we see for the first time in a while, some of us old enough to see different economies at different periods, different parts of the world are unlocked from others. Some I think are still white hot or becoming white hot. Some are really in low gear. And so what does that mean to the investment community, to us, to consumers, to executives trying to run global businesses? It's going to be kind of fun to think about from an investor perspective, how do we look at running companies and be great leaders? And who better to help us figure all of this out than a leader from the investment world, right? You got it. Our guest today uh, is Katie Koch, who's the president and CEO of TCW Group. As many of you know, it's a global asset management firm managing about $200 in client assets. Before TCW, uh, Katie spent 20 years at Goldman Sachs in the asset management division as a partner, and most recently as the chief investment officer of the $300 billion public equity business. She serves on a couple of boards, as you might expect, including the University of Notre Dame, which for Murphy is very important, um, <laughs> the Investment Fund for Foundations, the Investment Company Institute, Toygo Foundation, a great, great organization, and the Spent School as well. Katie, welcome to Redefiners. I'm so excited to be here. Thank you for having me, Clark and Hoda. We are thrilled. So before we jump in, uh, we know that you co-hosted Talks at GS when you were at Goldman Sachs. Um, So for our listeners who haven't seen it, Talks at GS was an interview series where you spoke with some of the world's greatest investors on their investment philosophies, their insights. And so as a former interview host, what advice would you have for us as we get started (laughs) with our conversation today? (laughs) Uh, You know what? Actually, I think... I get asked that a lot because I have the privilege of moderating a lot of discussions. First of all, it's so much better to be the interviewer. So congrats. (laughs) (laughs) You got got to be in control of the conversation, ask questions, and you're learning, which is fun because when you're talking, we know you're not learning. Uh, So I think it's a better job to have. And the advice I always give people on how how to do these things is to listen. I find that a lot of times people are just trying to kind of get to the next question to move through the content. You guys are good at this because I've listened to a few of your podcasts, but just that active listening and intentionality. So you hear the answer and you can pivot off that answer to the next relevant topic, which may not be like the next question on the on the Word document. But that's thank you for asking that. So many of our listeners, um, particularly young leaders, are how do I make the transition from a certain education or certain orientation into a given industry. Mm. So Notre Dame, humanities background, English and economics, which is kind of an interesting combination. Yeah. And then you end up in the investment business in Goldman for 20 years. Why why, why the investment business? Why financial services? How did you say, this is what I'm going to do? Uh, it was completely accidental, actually, uh, how I started. And I, I actually just said this to our interns because I, I get a little bit worried now. I don't know how you guys feel about this, but just how scripted everybody's life, they feel that they have to be this generation of people. Um, Even at Notre Dame, you have to express an interest in applying to the business school when you're a senior in high school. I mean, I just would, that would have, I would have not not even crossed my mind to do that. But you have to to declare that, then study finance in college, then get the internship. Then you, then, you know, you're starting your investment banking analyst, but you're only doing that because you know you want the job in private equity. I mean, I just did not, that's, that's, that is not the way my, it happened for me. And so I'll say it really briefly because I think I, I want people to know if they're listening to this and they don't know what they want to do yet, not only is that okay, that can actually be really great mm. because it widens the aperture of the, the opportunities. Um, and for me, I, I studied actually only literature up through my junior year. 
Um, and I uh, was with someone that I knew on campus at Notre Dame who was going to a job fair because back then in 2001, uh, when the dinosaurs roamed the earth, there was like a fitful <laughs> job fair with with papers and real people. I remember those. Yeah. So that was, and uh, you know, obviously I didn't know enough for it to be intimidating to me. So I kind of rolled up in my gym clothes and I said, so like, what's the best company to work? This is true story. What's the best company to work for in business? And my, this the person I was with was like, well, what kind of business? And I thought finance, because I just had heard about that or I knew something about personal investing. Uh, and they said Goldman Sachs. And I went to the job. I went to the table. I, I met the um, head of human resources. I pitched myself because I was a literature major. I did know how to tell my story, how to communicate, um, translate some of that experience into things that might be relevant in a business job. Um, and long story short, I ended up getting getting that internship and then the rest was history. And I guess what I learned, I mean, when I look back, I'm so happy, actually, that I um, mostly studied literature. Uh, once I realized exactly how much I didn't know in my internship, I did go back and I was able to pick up an econ major my senior year. But when I look at the long arc of my career, I actually think being a literature major has been the biggest advantage because you do learn from an investing perspective, specifically, you're taking disparate pieces of information and sources and pulling it together into a cogent thesis that you prosecute. And that's that's actually a lot of what investing is. And then from a leadership perspective, I continue to, to read a lot. I, you have a voracious appetite for information. Um, and if you're a reader and you're a writer, it does help you be a strong communicator. And communicating things clearly and concisely ends up being a really important skill set for a leader. So I got here very accidentally, um, but I came through a path that ended up probably I didn't realize at the time, but being a, a very big advantage for me. And as we talk about these, the arc of these journeys, this podcast in particular, Redefiners, we always ask, did you have a, a defining or redefining moment in your career mm -hmm. uh, that got you from there to here? I, I think that what really set me up in my career probably happened even before it started and um, was from my parents, maybe a little bit before and then a little bit during. So uh, family is the most important thing to me. It was when I was growing up, I was very lucky to have to incredible parents and I aspire to be like them for my, my own four children. Um, and it still is important to me. And I really try and keep that at the center, center of my life. My mom was very influential for me and I've, I've, I've shared this before, but it's so important to the risks that I've taken in my life that I want to highlight it here, which is that my mom always pushed me uh, and my siblings with this quote, she would say to us, well, what decision would you make if you knew you wouldn't fail? Mm. And that that was very important for me growing up because I was kind of like a perfectionist and risk averse and I only wanted to try things I knew I would succeed at. And that framing allowed me to come at the world instead of from a place of scarcity or a place of fear, actually a place of optimism and, and abundance. And it allowed me to take chances and risks that I otherwise wouldn't have taken. And if I look at this career I had, right, that the going up to the table to get the internship at Goldman Sachs, showing up as a least qualified person, you know, working hard to prove myself, putting my hand up for the next job. It's all those little risks and little leaps that eventually help you take the big leap to do a job like this to be CEO. So I'm very grateful to my mom for helping me uh, frame that that mindset. And then I would say just on my dad, he, um, he was my best friend. He's an extraordinary individual, very fo focused on morality and doing the right thing. And so he always pushed us, you know, in this family, we do the right thing, not the easy thing, not the expedient thing, not the popular thing the right thing. And that helps a lot in business because it's complicated and things get hard and there's um, difficult decisions you're always being faced with. And so if you have this lens through which to look at, which is we, you know, doing the right thing uh, by people, and we can come back to that more and in, in thinking about that and the companies we invest in, um, I think you'll, you'll generally get to the right place. So I appreciate that lesson from my parents. And I just want to end uh, by saying that um, I lost my dad about 10 years ago. He died in a bike accident, which was a, a really uh, tragic experience for me. And I, I had a uh, infant at the time. So I was I was living in London with Goldman. I came home for Thanksgiving. I had a, a, a newborn daughter um, and we were actually getting together as a family to see the Notre Dame game. My dad was out riding his bike and we never got to see that game. He was, he was killed oh. in this accident. It was terrible. 
Um, and it's, it was, it was a very, very awful experience. And anyone who's lost someone, uh, they love, which is all of us knows that you never get over it, but it is something you learn to carry with you. But, and I, I don't want to be Pollyannish about it, but I just wanted to highlight how that's impacted the way I lead until that point in life. I, I actually hadn't faced that much trauma or hardship. That was a very tough experience for me to get through personally um, and it helped me understand how important empathy is mm. for leadership. So when you're asking about these moments that transform you as a leader, for me, I, I used to always think about work as a hard charging place where we're just focused on results and we push as hard as we can. And there's truth to that. Um, but actually the way that Goldman Sachs showed up for me in that moment and supported me in relocating to be closer to my mom and, you know, showed up physically to, to celebrate the life of my dad um, and the way that people asked about me and looked after me and supported me made me so committed to that organization uh, for a very uh, another, you know, 10 years um, and made me feel seen as a whole person, which ends up being a really important thing to do as a leader. And so I really, you know, look back at that as something that helped me bring empathy to the way that I manage and lead teams. And I think has really been a contributor to, to the success that I've had as, as a leader over, over the long term. Um, and so empathy, I think, is at the heart, actually, of building successful businesses and cultures. And that is a takeaway from, from that experience. You, you've unpacked so many different and very important pieces around leadership. Um, and as you step into your, you know, year or so being a first time CEO, I think, um, you, you talked about empathy. You talked about, um, being seen, followership. What was the transition like? And what other lessons do you think you learned from some of these, you know, some of which have been very difficult experiences. Have you carried in as the as a first time CEO? Well, first, I just want to start by thanking um, Russell Reynolds uh, for giving me the opportunity to be a first time CEO, and specifically to uh, now my friend um, and partner in building this business, Jeff Warren and Hannah Brazier. Uh, and I think this is really important for getting more women into leadership roles too, because the easiest. Uh, thing you can do um, it to when you're hiring a new CEO is to hire someone that already has that title. But if we only do that, then we know it's going to be really tough to get different people into leadership positions. And so when I met um, Jeff and Hannah and I was able to tell my story using that literature background of communication and say, yeah, I haven't yet done the CEO job, but here's all the experience I have. I've led people, problems and process at scale, got trained as an executive at Goldman. I know how to do stakeholder management. Um, and they were will they were willing to see how that could translate successfully into the CEO role, even though I didn't come in with that title. And they helped me break an incredible barrier um, by getting that spot and that chance to be a first-time CEO. And I have just enormous gratitude to both of them for their support through the process and their wisdom, of course, in choosing me. Um, <laughs> I, I, uh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> but they've just become extraordinary partners and you get to know each other really well through that. And actually, then when I work with them now on recruiting, it's it's just such a seamless process because they know what our values are what the culture is that we're trying to build here. And I just have incredible gratitude to them. And then um, not to make this a commercial for Russell Reynolds, but you asked about being a first time CEO. So I did want to give a shout out to Ty Wiggins, who's a coach, an executive coach at, at Russell Reynolds. Um, and the board, by the way, had the wisdom to say, yes, we're going to hire you. You're a first time CEO. We want you to get coaching, right? Which was good mm -hmm. that, because it made me start that process very early. Um, and he was extraordinary. And he still is extraordinary. And when I have a challenge or a problem where I want to know how to frame something, I still call him. He wrote a book. I wrote I wrote it down. Uh, the new CEO lessons um, from uh, new CEOs on how to start well and perform quickly, I think is it. So I would recommend to everybody to to read that. I wish he had written it before I started because I, I would. <laughs> There's variability on coaching because I have heard from other first-time CEOs and leaders that they haven't had as much success. I think what makes him uniquely good at this is that he's able to build interpersonal trust with people. So when he went around to get the yeah. feedback on me from everybody, they were really open with what their perspectives and feedback were. And so that was very valuable part of the process, the 360-degree feedback. And he and I built a great relationship. 
um, still have one. And like I said, when I'm trying to figure out how to approach a certain person or a certain topic, and I really want to think about how to frame it, um, he's he's the first person I call. So I'd highly recommend people transitioning into a leadership role to get a coach and get a really great one like Ty. That's really great advice. Making tough decisions. Yeah. In this transition, you and I talked at one point and someone made a comment to you about, you know, you're going to be able to make the tough decisions. Yeah. Have you, has this year been one of tough decisions mm -hmm. and or creating a vision? I'm sure it's creating a vision and creating followership and building a team. Yeah. But how do you view first time CEO and like, oh my God, this is brutal. And, and I'm at the end of the table all alone or not? Oh, no, it's been very easy. No tough decisions. Had to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I mean, it's really tough. Actually, it's very rewarding, but it's really tough. And so one one uh, phrase that someone gave to me that I, I think about a lot um, is tough decisions, easy life, e easy decisions, tough life. Mm. So one of the ways that I kind of gear myself up to make those difficult decisions is, first of all, always putting at the center of everything, like re what's the right thing for TCW? That's something I learned, by the way, at Goldman Sachs from one of my mentors, Stephen Scher, who used the term um, industrial logic. Like if you're coming at it from the place of like, what's the right thing for the company and the clients, you you'll end up with the right decision more often than not. Of course, you're gonna get some things wrong, but you'll be trending in the right direction. And so you start everything with that framework of what's the right thing for TCW and our clients. And that, that has to be the North Star. And then you can orient your decisions around that. Um, but you have to push yourself sometimes to make the brave decision because it may be near term quite stressful or a difficult conversation or friction involved with that. But you're actually opening up the pathway for success. And that that's what that quote reminds me of. And so, yes, there are tough decisions. The framework is what's the right thing for the company. And you have to have the bravery and the commitment um, and the confidence to to take those decisions and, and, and for the long term benefit of the company. And then also, I alluded to this, but I want to emphasize it again. I look back the last 18 months, I've gotten more decisions right than wrong. But of course, I've had a lot of wrong decisions. So you need to just be able to recover, correct those re and recover from them. And that 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 framework's been helpful for me. You talk about um, uh, at Goldman, you just mentioned quickly multi-stakeholder management. Yeah. For those who don't know, TCW's 31% owned by the Carlisle Group, 25% owned by Nippon Life, and employees own 44%. So what's it like to make multi-stakeholder decisions and what's it like to basically run an employee-owned company? So let me just start with saying that I love being at a private company. That it, I, I knew that I wanted to do that because I ran a large public investing business, which you said at the outset, and it always seemed more fun to me to invest in public companies than run them. <laughs> <laughs> but the CEOs and on, like there's a million reasons for that, but a main one is just the court the pressure of quarterly results um, is really tough to make those good decisions to orient yourself for the long term. And most of asset management is actually about managing long-term liabilities, helping people save for retirement. So why would I want to be under the pressure of quarterly decision points or worrying about inflows every quarter if I'm actually trying to help our clients for the long term? So being private, I think, is, is I would put it at the top of the list of advantages. And then you get to this shareholder structure. And my partners are are extraordinary. I wasn't sure how to think about that, you know, th the three sides of this, the employees, Carlisle and Nippon Life, because they're all different groups. So I'll hit on that quickly and then I'll say the benefits of employee ownership. Um, Carlisle Group, of course, is a is a leading global asset manager now run by uh, one of my old partners from Goldman, Harvey Schwartz. We have a great relationship with them. They really understand the asset management industry. And so they're, you know, quite informed at the table um, you know, able to, for, for example, right now we're making an investment um, to do more in credit alternatives. And that's obviously a space they know well as an alternative firm. And they're able to kind of get behind and help us form that strategy, which is great. The other thing that matters if you have private equity ownership is that you have uh, duration of capital mm. um, and we're in their long-term fund. So in addition to them giving good strategic advice, understanding asset management, uh, we we have, you know, a long, long, long runway with them as an investor, which is great. Um, and then we have Nippon Life, um, who, who is a very long-term oriented thinker um, and owner. And they also are Japan's largest life insurance company. And so CEOs like me, 
it's incredible to have proximity to that kind of insurance balance sheet. They are also one of our largest clients. And then the employees, what I wanted to end with is that it creates such great alignment of interest for the employees to have a large ownership in the company, alignment with certainly with the clients being at the top of that list. And the other thing that it enables me to do is that as a lot of our senior investors are large equity holders, it is a tool in which to get people to think outside of their silo or business and across the whole platform. And I, I think that is going to continue to be part of the future of asset management and certainly fixed income markets that we have to look across, for example, within compliance and legal restrictions, the public, uh, private worlds of credit, just as an example. And one of the ways you, you know, you motivate people to do that through culture, through delivering for the client, which has to be at the top of our list of priorities, but also having people be an equity holder in the whole entity is another really powerful way for, to motivate people to deliver on behalf of not just their individual business, but on, on TCW. And Katie, as you're navigating and managing through the different stakeholder groups, you know, there's there's clearly going to be at times different opinions and perspectives. And we're now in, uh, you know, in an economy where there are different perspectives on will it, won't it, back and forth, recession coming, not coming. How are you thinking about that? And what's your view today on where we are as an economy? Stakeholder management, uh, you can make it as complicated as you want. In my view, I have a very simple business, which is that we, our clients are the business. We need to deliver excellent long-term results for clients. And that has to be at the heart of everything we do and every decision we make. And we want to stay investment-led organization focused on outstanding performance. So that's where we start every conversation. And that's the North Star from which we make every decision. And that really helps us unify everybody around the table if we keep that at the center of, of our priorities. Um, so I'd say that. And then, yes, of course, there's different views on where the the economy is headed. Um, I, I I lack the proverbial crystal ball to tell you, you know, exactly where <laughs> GDP is going to be every quarter. But let me say a couple of big picture things. Um, the first thing is that macro is really tough and it can be binary. And so one thing I'm focused on is across the platform of TCW, we do have a lot of strategies that are not macro dependent, right? So our equity strategies are largely idiosyncratic. Everything's really bottom up driven. In our private credit business, you know, we just underwrite like there's going to be a recession tomorrow. So that's the mindset of that business. Um optimistic lending's not not a good type of lending. I, I, so if we just are pessimistic about where the world's headed and underwrite to that tough outcome, um, and then, you know, obviously out deliver over that. And then um, in the liquid fixed income markets, we have some strategies that are bottom-up idiosyncratic. And then in our core plus space, we do express some macro views there, which people own in their retirement accounts. So I'll speak to that. In that pool of assets where we can express a macro view, um, we are more conservatively positioned. Um, so I don't want to get super technical on this podcast, but we do, we are overweight agency MBS, which is a AAA credit, highly liquid, deep, and that helps us kind of carry over the index, say defensive, conservative, and liquid. And then what this team is extraordinary at doing is they'll lean into an eventual dislocation in the market. So as an example, we were positioned similarly um, in the COVID period, and then we put $20 billion to work in credit um, during COVID. And last year, um, again, liquid, conservatively positioned, carrying over the index, um, this team ended up being the largest holder of uh, Credit Suisse Senior Hold Co. bonds, which they bought into the 60s and were pulled to par. So that's the that's how we are positioned. We're a little bit more conservative than consensus. Um, we are staying liquid because we think that there's too much complacency in markets. And I would express I would say that to you by looking at equity valuations, which are at record highs, mm -hmm. and credit valuations, which are at record tights. So we think that that is not in line with some of the challenges we see ahead for the economy. And we're going to stay and wait and lean in when something breaks. So just so the world's more volatile. Mm -hmm. As a leader, particularly to young leaders who have never seen e e markets like this. Yeah. How mm -hmm. do you how do you extend calm 25 years of experience we're going to manage our way through this successfully. You talked about like you did in the credit business coming out of the, these decisions. How do you as a leader articulate navigating volatile markets? 
So I want to just start by saying these are extraordinary markets for active managers, which is what we do. Um, so when you have these dislocations, when you have this volatility, that presents an incredible opportunity for you to provide differentiated results for your clients. And that's literally the business that we're in. Um, and so it, just going to rates, for example, who have, which have changed trajectories, you know, we all get to be geniuses when money is free. Both people that run companies, it's not that hard to run a company if capital's free and also to invest in them. You know, now capital's been repriced aggressively and we're, we're at the early stages of seeing the way that that impacts markets. Um, we haven't even gotten into, you know, the default cycle, which will eventually come from having higher higher rates. And this is an extraordinary environment for active managers. So I would just start with saying that for the business that we're in, volatility is good news because we need differentiated pricing and uh, differentiated performance of securities to provide differentiated outcomes. And we are target rich for that right now across the capital structure. So that's good news. You asked another important question is, how do you lead people through that? Um, and I would say, I'm going to answer this from the investing angle, which is that there, there, there's two to me in my you know 20 years of pattern recognition on this. Well, actually three qualities um, that I think are so important for successful investing. The first is humility, which I talk about a lot. That's just delighting in the things that you don't know. This concept of asking the questions and listening, which we talked about at the outset, uh, that there, that is when you are humble, you are in a learning state and the best investors are learning machines. So that's one. The second is impossible to, to, to replicate, which is just longevity, which Clark alluded to. There's, I can't think of an industry where it's more important to have gone through different cycles to understand, you know, what the world looks like when capital is not free, as an example, right? Or what it feels like to be through a 40% drawdown or go through the financial crisis or experience the tech bubble. You just can't replicate that. You have to have kind of lived through it, make the mistakes that you're likely to make along the trajectory of a long career, learn from them and, you know, make new mistakes. So I, you cannot replicate longevity. And we, th we talk about that a lot in private credit as an example, because most of the asset class started post global financial crisis yeah. in a, it's yeah. a young asset class in a one way environment. And that is why we have been very vocal that there will be some accidents ahead and massive manager differentiation, which will benefit from. Um, and then the third is discipline of process. And it's so interesting because when I'm out with clients, sometimes LPs, clients, they ask you, they want to know what your edge is. And, and sometimes people are looking for a super sexy answer. But actually, to me, and I, I really believe this, the most critical edge you can have, and, and very few people are able to do this, is to have a disciplined process that you prosecute again and again, regardless of the environment. Most people actually get off course from what their process is based on what the environment is. They're worried about the Magnificent Seven yeah. and their performance yeah. and how much it's dominating portfolios. So you just start to shift because, you know, there's there's the fear of being fired or being wrong or or standing out in a bad way and people get pulled into that. Or in the private credit space, maybe you're trying to, you start to prioritize deployment of capital um, over underwriting and you get out of the business of saying no a lot, which is usually a successful uh, way to do lending into the business of being a forced lender. I mean, whatever asset class you're looking at, people stray from the discipline of the process that made them successful. And so I think, you know, you asked the question, how do you lead people through this? Hopefully, You've had a process in place for so long that the process is the star. The process is the thing that everybody can come back to when you're being buffeted by the vicissitudes of fortune. And it allows you to move forward and execute for your clients without a lot of drama. That discipline of process is what allowed our fixed income team to step into Credit Suisse when everybody was running the other direction. You can't just wake up and say, hey, yeah. we should do that. Let's buy this bank that everyone else thinks <laughs> is going to zero, right? Like you you have to have lived that process and had it embedded in the DNA of the team for a long time to make money in investing, which is generally, we all know, we make the most money for our clients when we step into something that others can't or won't do. And Katie, on this piece around the discipline of the process, how do you view technology and particularly AI? It's obviously on everyone's mind to accelerate some of the transformation or accelerate some of the great aspects that you already have with the discipline of the process. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? So 
when you think about technologies that were, this is kind of in my, my professional career, probably the fourth big shift. So let me just start with AI is a real thing and it's a big thing, right? So that we had, I, I'm someone knows these better than me, but like you had personal computers, then we have like the, the web, then you have mobile and cloud, and now we have AI. And if you look at all four of those, they change the world in some meaningful way. And I think that's what this is. So you just first have to say, is it real and is it big? And I think it is. And then when you think about tech cycles, you know, something that I've learned from the tech investors I've worked with is that they tend to follow a, a similar cycle from an investing perspective. So you start with... Um, the technology trigger, which we uh, everyone knows that AI and machine learning we've had for a long time. We've had an AI fund for 10 years. So like this is not new, but we did have the tech, we could call the ch tech trigger, at least to the public, um, chat GPT, right? Where it really, st people started to, to see it, use it, that gets us to more use cases. Then you get to the peak of um, enthusiasm, um, and the, and the peak of inflated expectations. Then you get kind of this slope of disillusionment that happens for a long time. And then you get what they call, uh, the slope of enlightenment where you really get, uh, sustained use cases and true transformation of businesses. So where, so you really need to kind of figure out where you are on that. And on, there's so many people better capable of answering that than me, but I don't even think we've gotten to the peak of inflated ex expectations yet. So we've had this recent rotation away from technology for the first time in a long time in this month of this year. But it's it's very actually subtle if you look at the long-term charts. Like I, I don't think we've gotten to peak expectations on AI. In other words, we have a long journey to go here. I think from an investing perspective over the next 20 years, it'll probably be one of the greatest things to be invested in. And I could, and the, I think the internet is a great parallel to this, yeah. which is if you bought the internet in the late nineties, early two thousands, you would have made a lot of money, even if you invested through that tech bubble, but you had to have the longevity of capital to stick through that. And there were a lot of ups and downs and you should have been actively managing it because some companies went away and some became winners. And we didn't even imagine how it would disrupt, for example, the retail market when we were all talking about technology in the late nineties. So that's where we are with AI. It's early in the journey. If you have a long horizon, in for investing, I would absolutely get behind it. I would manage it actively and I would stay invested for a long time. And hopefully it'll be the greatest wealth creation opportunity in the markets like the internet was. But there's going to be a lot that goes wrong between now and then too. Um, okay, so that's investing. Then from a CEO perspective, so here's what I would say. We have a great chief technology officer. And what I'm going to lead to here is that I think people overestimate the transformation on businesses. We have a great chief te technology officer We've organized our data. It's in the cloud. Uh, we use um, analytical software on that data. And so we're pretty well set up. That differentiates us from, by the way, the majority of companies in America. So like just to get to the point where you can use AI, you have to do all of those things. And most people aren't there yet, even in the asset management industry. And then you have to say, okay, do I have the engineering talent to be able to make use of this? And I don't. I just want to be honest, no yeah. leading AI engineers coming to work at TCW. I can get the yeah. world's best credit and equity investors uh, for, for my clients here, but not the world's best AI talent. So we've done a partnership with Microsoft, with Azure, where they've lent us some of their engineers. And we've worked on a few discrete projects around AI. And we have actually made progress. So we have actually found some use cases where we can use AI to help us read through 800-page loan documents and get to some answers more quickly and also do some screening around sustainability. Um, but I would say it took a lot of effort to get to that one use case. And there's so much friction here along this process, having the data, putting it in the cloud, having access to the engineering talent, having the humans that are willing to disrupt their own jobs. Mm -hmm. Right. Because you could, right. you know, if you find a gap, yeah, you have absolutely. to do your job. You have to be willing to do that. And then also have a business that can work with the tech talent because it's a true partnership. Because those, those engineers from Microsoft, as talented and as insightful and as amazing as they are, and how they're, they're clearly a leading company on AI and we're invested that way too. Um, they don't really know a lot about the CLO market or the loan doc. So you have to pair that with someone who actually understands the business use case. Oh, I think it's possible. It'll be transformative. We're spending time on it, but there's much more friction to the process than it's probably priced into the market right now in terms of transformation. So, Katie, we, we end every podcast with a series of rapid fire questions. Just answer what comes immediately to your mind uh, and, we'll, and we'll just go one after another and Hoda's going to lead off. Oh, God, this sounds scary. 
Okay, since we talked a little bit about people living longer and retirement and all of those different parts uh, of how we show up as human beings, where would you want to live when you retire if you could live anywhere in the world? I think New Zealand. Oh. Nice. Yeah. Nice. Very cool. I'll be living next door to you. That works. Will you? Yeah. No, I I, I really <laughs> love, I, I just such an, ex- only if my kids are there though. So I don't know. It's a hard, hard question, but I love that country and I love that I can be outside and I'm learning how to play golf and uh, great wine. And um, it, whenever I visit there, I always think it's one of the most extraordinary places in the world. So I would do it if I could have my family with me. Okay. Second question. Are you a morning person or a night owl? I'm morning. I get up early. And since we're still in the summer months, what's your favorite type of vacation destination? Beach, mountains, city and culture? Mountains. We like doing a lot. It's one of our favorite parts of of having had the privilege to move to LA is being around the mountains, both for skiing and hiking, but that helps us get outside and get exercise. Love the mountains. Advice. What's the one important skill every person should have? Empathy. Would you rather have regrets about actions or inactions? Oh, actions. Okay. (laughs) I I knew the answer to that one really, (laughs) really fast. (laughs) Katie's never been known for inaction, okay? It's okay. Yeah. Um, If you were to give one book to everyone on your team, what would it be and why? Um, David Brooks, How to Know a Person, which I I probably have some recency bias in that answer because I just finished listening to that. Um, But this goes back to this topic of empathy, that we're managing human beings, and that how much more progress you can make as an organization if you really get to know everyone that works with you as an individual and see them as a person and understand what drives them and motivates them. I just think it it is such an important skill, and not everybody comes here with that skill. Uh, And me too. It's something obviously I have to work on my whole life. Uh, but I re- I've already recommended it to many of the people I work with. Um, so I, I think it's an extraordinary book. And then last question, what is a piece of advice someone has given you that has really stuck with you? I'm going to go back to Ty Wiggins, my my coach um, from, from Russell Reynolds. And this is one that's really helped me the last 18 months. We've had to drive a lot of evolution on the platform, you know, respect the heritage of what makes TCW incredible, which is a lot of things, um, including investment culture, being investment led, et cetera, but then also evolve for the future because the world's going to, you know, is changing and will change a lot over the next decade. And so, you know, I kept saying to him, well, this is tough because, you know, to talk, you know, when I was had these sessions, obviously part of his job is to listen to me complain. So I would complain (laughs) to him and say, this is really difficult. This is challenging. It's tough. People are afraid of change. And he corrected me rightly and said, no, people are not afraid of change. They're afraid of loss of control. Mm -hmm. And so it really shifted the way that I led and managed people to say, okay, we're going to evolve and you can be part of the benefits of that journey. And you are in control of your destiny. We will give you the tools to actually be in the driver's seat of how we drive this. I just need you to be along with me on this journey. And he really reframed that for me and helped me understand people's psychology uh, better on, on how to drive the evolution that TCW needs for the next 10 years. So I'm very grateful to him for that. Katie, thanks so much for being here. Uh, incredible discussion and, and so much to cover. But as we think about lessons learned uh, your foundation, both in your family and, and education, but the importance of empathy to you as a leader uh, and that empathy should be at the heart of, of creating or maintaining a corporate culture. But using that empathy and culture, that leadership is taking people where they probably don't want to go, but helping them get there. Uh, and, and the risk taken as a first-time CEO, both getting the backing of the board, but you taking risk and and making tough decisions. As you said, tough decisions, easy life, easy decisions, tough life. So let's make the tough decisions and have the confidence to make them. But you start tough decisions with what's right for the clients so that TCW is positioned and learn from your father and from others, position the firm around the clients and taking joy in being a private company so that as you manage different stakeholders, the largest stakeholder is your own employees. And so employee-owned company in a private setting helps them make decisions across the firm, be more creative and take some risk. You talk about the story of investing in the Credit Suisse bonds, which was so successful. 
because they were comfortable thinking outside their own silos to make great decisions, but also take risk. In volatile markets, what does it mean to lead in such volatility? And you say, these are extraordinary markets, and it gives us the opportunity to outperform. Capital has been repriced. Volatility is good news if you're an, an active investor, and this shows when we can differentiate our performance. So to differentiate performance, what are the qualities most important to be a successful investor? Humility is the first. When you're humble, you learn. Second is longevity. If you've seen a lot of cycles, you're a better and better and better and better investor as time goes on, and you can't replicate longevity. And third is discipline of process. Don't go to the shiny new thing or the sexy thing because the market goes against you. Stick to the discipline of the process and you'll execute well and don't vary away from it. And finally, we all talk about AI um, and, and your belief that, you know, this is both real and this is big. It's the fourth big shift. You talk about that in depth and you've embraced friction, friction as learning and partnership with others to take advantage of this. Well, you are not a leader who has a lot of friction. You're a leader with empathy, but you take risk and you push. And there's a lot for us to learn as redefining our own leadership here. Thanks again, Katie. So fun. Fun, insightful, demanding, forward-looking, and a little challenging. That might be Katie Koch right there. So, <laughs> <Yeah>. uh, <laughs> so. <laughs> Katie, thank you so much. It was really fun. It was great to get to know both of you. And thank you for doing this podcast. I appreciate it. Thank you. 